So to round out our series of didactic lectures, uh, we've asked uh, <clears throat> Dr. Eric Yonash to put on his, uh, to bring his crystal ball and to tell us what the future holds for the treatment of patients with uh, kidney cancer. Thank you very much, and thanks for coming today. What I want to do is I want to talk a little bit from a little bit of a standpoint of what do we know, but also trying to put myself in the shoes of a patient who's getting on to perhaps uh, um, one of the websites to look at the clinical trials that are there and sort of think about this in terms of what are the doctors thinking and how are they actually coming up with these treatments. I'm going to use kidney cancer, RCC, and renal cell carcinoma interchangeably in this talk with regards to, and it's all going to be talking about kidney, renal cell carcinoma. I'm going to specify some of the subsets of renal cell carcinoma with regards to whether it's clear cell or non-clear cell um, as I move forward. So uh, late last night I got onto clinicaltrials.gov, and I'm not sure how many of you actually have gotten onto this website, and I typed in renal cell carcinoma and I found 1,394 studies, which is pretty daunting, even for somebody who does this for a living. And then I used some of the filters, and I got down to 332, quote, unquote, interventional studies, which would be studies that would probably be something that the doctors are doing something about. And, and the question I asked myself is, in terms of what we and my peers around the country and around the world are doing, what are the new approaches that we can see uh, are being currently tested? And, based on my knowledge, what are the promising new avenues in the treatment of kidney cancer? So I did this analysis and I looked at all the drugs that are being tested. And here's the laundry list of agents. And again, I looked at this and I have to admit, I have to look up a couple of these. And now organized it into various different categories of things that are being tested uh, in 2015 for RCC. And these include angiogenesis inhibitors, or blood vessel starving therapies, very similar to the ones that have been approved that Dr. Tanir eloquently described. There are tumor cell signaling modulators, things that are kind of getting inside the, the tumor cell itself to change the way it behaves. There are what I would call Trojan horse therapies, taking advantage of receptors or proteins that are uniquely found on the surface of kidney cancer cells that allow us to deliver some sort of lethal payload. There are the old-fashioned DNA damaging agents, that's old-fashioned chemotherapy stuff, a fair number of immunotherapies, and then something called epigenetic modulator, which we're not really going to be able to get into today. So quite a few different things. So what are these drugs all trying to do? Predominantly, uh, point number one is uh, what we've been most successful at, is blocking angiogenesis. Point number two, the new up-and-coming and exciting things that Dr. Gao nicely outlined are these immune system modulators. Number three are ways to actually say, this is how a cancer cell is different from other cells. Can we actually target it that way? Number four is breaking DNA. Uh, and again, this is a really old-fashioned thing, but probably in three or four years from now when we talk again, number four is probably going to get kind of exciting again. And then number five is targeting unique aspects of the cancer metabolism because they don't use fuels the same way that, that normal cells do in some cases, and that's another thing we can do. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to sort of take us on a tour of why does renal cell carcinoma happen? What are these sort of initiating events? Uh, what are the things that make them evolve into the things that they are, and what are a couple of the things that are being done now to try to treat it? So coming up with a cure for kidney cancer requires a peeling back of the onion. There's many, many layers, and the more all of us who do this for a living are doing this, the more we sort of think, hey, we know something, and then you realize that there's another layer of complexity. And that layer of complexity is really important because the, the law of causative effect cause and effect when you do one thing and you think it's going to do another, if there's a whole bunch of other things that are going to happen afterwards that you're not aware of, you might end up actually being further back than you thought. So we need to identify the driver genes. And this is this idea that, we've, uh, that uh, Dr. Tanir talked about, saying if we can do a biopsy, we can look at the genetic mutations, and that will then be able to maybe give us some sort of way of targeting drugs against those mutations. 
The problem is we have to understand how do those mutations affect the proteins that they generate. And we need functional understanding. The next thing we need to do is we need to understand how do those proteins that are mutated and not working properly interact with other ones. Because in isolation, we might again be doing one thing that's going to do the opposite. And then we have to be able to test this in what we call model systems. Obviously, the ultimate test of any treatment is to do this in patients. And that's what we do when we're pretty confident. But ideally, we'd have something where we could take a step back and we would either have an animal system or something that could allow us to basically do a test drive of these things before we try them in patients. That would be ideal. And in 2015, those model systems really are not that well developed. So what are we made of? How do we actually come about? Chromosomes. So here's 23 chromosomes, or 46 in total because they're paired. And actually, one little you know, neat thing is, how are they numbered? What, how did chromosomes get numbered? Well, it's because number one was the biggest one, and 22 was the smallest. So that's why you know one through 23, 22. So you actually don't need to be an expert on chromosome biology to know which chromosome number you are if you're looking at the others. So kind of interesting. And we've got the uh, XY chromosomes here at the end. So in the chromosomes, we have a variety of different genes, right? So you'll have one allele, one of the genes in one chromosome, and the same, and we have pairs of these genes, right? And these genes then express these proteins, and you know, the reason we have two copies is so that in case one gets broken, the other one will kind of work. Well, sometimes you'll get a mutation, and you'll have one of these proteins or genes that gets messed up, and that's obviously bad. Um, then you might have the second one that's broken, and that's going to be really bad, and you're going to have loss of that particular protein in the cell or function of that cell, and depending on how critical it is, that could have some major consequences. In clear cell renal cell carcinoma, the consequences of loss of the VHL gene are pretty significant. This seems to be the, the, the truncal, the sort of the original problem that gives rise to clear cell kidney cancer. And this is a uh, sort of depiction. The red is the depiction of the VHL protein and it associates with other proteins to create a complex, and it does something which is it blocks HIF, hypoxiodisable factor. And HIF is a factor that then goes and tells the cell to produce blood vessels. Clear cell renal cell carcinoma, as I mentioned, has v mutations in VHL. So what does VHL do exactly? So here we have a cell that has low oxygen level. What's going to happen then? is you're going to have VHL is basically going to stand back, and HIF is going to be able to combine, and it's going to be able to tell the nucleus to then transcribe blood vessel forming genes like VEGF. And that's why renal cell carcinoma, if you look at it under the microscope, it's got tons of blood vessels. It's one of the sine qua nons of clear cell renal cell carcinoma. So then if you have normal oxygen levels and the cell says, you know, I'm Pretty perfectly happy, thank you very much. VHL is then going to grab onto HIF and it's going to degrade it somewhat more quickly. Okay, it's going to make it go away, um, and uh, that way you don't get those abnormal blood vessel formations. But if you have a mutation in VHL, what ends up happening is you don't have um, the control over HIF and you get all of these blood vessels that are forming inappropriately. And that seems to create. And that in of itself might not actually cause other mutations and things like that, but it creates what I would call a nice nest for all sorts of nasty experiments to occur in those cells, those damaged cells, which then result in the, the other mutations from occurring. So there's other things that are required to make a kidney cancer, a renal cell carcinoma, a renal cell carcinoma. You've got to have the VHL mutation, but you need to have other DNA alterations. So it's VHL plus that then makes the tumor, okay? And then further alterations that then actually make the cancer progress and become really, really dangerous. And so the question then really is, VHL plus what else is necessary to make this kidney cancer begin? And we actually, in 2015, are only starting to understand what the other things are. And there are things like SETD2, PBRM1, and BAP1. So there are other muted, mutated genes that have to work together. So you can start seeing how this is getting a little bit complicated. The next point is that then 
the chromosomes. You know, I showed you those nice pictures of 46 chromosomes, and that's the way it should be. But in tumors, what happens is you start losing and gaining entire chromosomes. And so what we have here is we have clear cell kidney cancer, and we've got um, red, meaning you're missing something, and green, meaning you've got too much of something. And then we've got one, two, three, four, five, all the way up to 23 uh, or 22, actually, here. And you can see that this up here is clear cell kidney cancer. You can see that chromosome 3, for the large part, is missing. We can see chromosome 14 in more aggressive tumors is missing. And we have gains of chromosome 7. So there's, there's a chromosome 5 and 7. So there's things here that start changing as well. And you lose entire amounts of uh, numbers of genes here. This is now below here is, is papillary kidney cancer, where you see it's a different pattern. Here we see chromosome 7. There's a lot of extra chromosome 7, and it turns out, I'll talk about in a little bit, MET is a per very important protein that if you have too much of it, it again creates that environment that the tumors can start forming in. So as I mentioned before, there are a couple of genes that are frequently lost in addition to VHL. VHL is lost, and then that arm, that three, that short arm of chromosome 3 is lost, and these genes, in addition, then you lose an additional copy then of PBRM1, SETD2, and BAP1. And for ways that we don't quite understand yet, that's how kidney cancers start developing. The last little sort of piece of, of biology here, and the quiz is only going to be about 20 questions afterwards, so you don't have to pay too much attention. Um, so is that when you then look at a particular tumor, and you ask the question of, well, what are the mutations in this corner of the tumor versus the mutations in that corner of the tumor? It turns out that it's actually somewhat different. And what's happening is that you get this little engine of, of badness, if you will, and the mutations that are occurring in a somewhat random fashion, and there's competition within these subcells for the ones that are going to be the, have the greatest fitness and the ones that ultimately are going to be the worst for, for you, the patient. And so our understanding of what these processes are that actually sort of get the ball rolling down the hill for cancer formation are critical for us to be able to ask the right questions, do the right tests, come up with the curative therapies. Okay? So this is the sort of stuff, you know, my, my patients sort of ask, Dr. Yonish, what do you do when you're not seeing patients? So it's, you know, trying to figure out how to put ourselves out of business and thinking about this underlying biology so that we can actually come up with better therapies. So here's now, let's say, pretend is a tumor, okay? We've got not just the cancer cells. We've got the cancer cells here, okay, and uh, at the bottom. We've got blood vessel cells that supply blood to the cancer, and we have these glue cells that I would call them, which are a combination of things that kind of literally glue things together, plus the cells that Dr. Gao was talking about, the immune cells. And when we're treating a cancer, we're treating an entire organ. Okay, it's, it's an organ that's made up of blood vessels, of immune cells that are in there, some which are good for us, the patients, uh, some are bad, and, and the tumor cells. And again, when we come up with treatment strategies, we have to think about it on that macroscopic scale. So, on to some of the treatments that are coming down the pipeline. We know that anti-VEGF therapy or blood vessel starving therapy like Sutent and Votriant are fantastic drugs. Um, they really have made a difference. They're not enough. Um, we know that there's about 20 or so percent of people who, when they start receiving these drugs, uh, they don't benefit at all. We know that most people who are on these drugs, although we have some wonderful outliers in our clinics, most people eventually, things are gonna, these drugs will kind of run out of gas for reasons that we don't fully understand yet. So what are the things can we do to come up with other treatments? So I'm going to talk a little bit about some ideas, like, for example, fixing broken VHL. Number two, are there other proteins that are upregulated in uh, cancers that we should also be targeting in addition to uh, VHL and, and VEGF? Um, what about the metabolism story that I talked about? And the last one is the Duke poliovirus, because I've gotten a lot of questions from patients about should we be getting the virus? So let's talk about each of these. First of all, let's talk about fixing broken VHL. So as I mentioned before, obviously VHL mutation is one of the key things that happens in clear cell kidney cancer. So wouldn't it be great if we could do like gene therapy? We could just put the VHL gene back in that cell and maybe the cell would stop behaving, misbehaving. 
So there's a couple of ways that we can kind of indirectly get at that. The first is I mentioned that one of the key things that VHL does is it regulates HIF. So you lose VHL, HIF goes up. So why don't we try blocking HIF directly? And the second thing is, why don't we go all the way back, and is there maybe a subset of VHL mutations we can directly fix? So blocking HIF has actually been really, really hard. So coming up with a drug that actually will stop some protein from being expressed in a cell, sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's hard. HIF is a transcription factor, and that class of drugs is actually remarkably difficult to target. But fortunately, recently, very smart chemists have come up with a drug that seems to be doing that to some degree. And there's actually, um, in that laundry list that I showed at the beginning, there's this one study um, testing a novel HIF2 alpha inhibitor. We don't know anything about how good it is yet, but it is actually trying to get closer and closer to the source, if you will. It's like one step removed from VHL. So this is an example, you know, where you have loss of VHL, you have VHL, which is blocking HIF, uh, which causes too much VEGF. So here, we're directly trying to block HIF. One of the problems with that is that although, again, this is another layer of the onion, we said that HIF is a really important target for VHL. VHL actually does a bunch of other things. So when you lose VHL and you remediate the HIF side of things, you're still left with several other points that might be a problem. So actually getting VHL completely normalized would be even better. So what's interesting is if you look at various VHL mutations, so how many of you know what a Western blot is? Well, here's a Western blot. So basically what this is, is we're taking proteins from different cells and we're allowing us to quantitate them by looking at them side by side in this blot thing. And the bigger the band, the more protein there is. And so uh, we're, w these numbers here on the top are different mutant VHLs that we've in introduced into, the same, into cell lines. And you can see that there's big differences in this, right? Here's the normal one. You can see there's a fair amount of it. And you can see quite a number of these other VHL mutants are much, much lower expressed. But what's interesting is if you actually look at their function, they're still able to do, for example, getting rid of HIF. So you can see here this one here. There's no, there's no HIF, so it's doing its job. Well, this guy here who's um, uh, got low levels isn't doing that good a job of doing it. This one here is still able. So maybe if we could raise the level of some of these proteins, we might actually get them to work better. And there are some drugs that can block the degradation of proteins. The brotezomib is a proteasome inhibitor, which is an example of this. And we can see here that if we give brotezomib, we can raise VHL levels, and we can lower HIF levels. So it's an interesting idea, maybe works. We tested this in 12 patients so far. Uh, we're, we're limited by the kinds of drugs we use and so we used a drug called carfizomib, which actually had a fair number of side effects. Um, but we're right now testing whether or not any of those individuals we treated, whether or not their VHL mutation was rescuable or not. And we have a number of grants that have been submitted and they're underway trying to find better ways to do this. So it's just an example of kind of thinking outside of the box, how can we actually change the way we treat, treat patients? So something that's perhaps a little closer to us and might actually get closer to real time is targeting MET and Axel. So as I mentioned, um, MET uh, is upregulated in papillary kidney cancer, and I'll show you that in a second, and it also seems to be upregulated in clear cell kidney cancer. And there's another closely related protein called Axel. So let me tell you a little bit about this. So back to the chromosomal copy number. Chromosome 7 is where MET lives. And if you look at papillary kidney cancer, you can see here that there's lots of extra chromosome 7, which means there's lots of extra MET, and that makes the tumor cells happy and us not so happy. If you also look at clear cell kidney cancer, you see there's also extra chromosome 7, meaning there's extra MET. If you then look at whether the over higher levels of MET are associated with worse outcome in patients with kidney cancer, the answer is yes. So we looked at this in tissues from our clinical trials, and we saw that if you had a high MET level, your overall survival was lower, and also your response, the time that you were responding to blood vessel starving or antiangiogenic therapy was less. So high MET is not good even in clear cell kidney cancer. And then what we did is we asked the question in a model system where we grew tumors in the flanks of mice, 
we treated with Sutent, and then we said, all right, when the tumor starts resist, developing resistant to Sutent, and we add cabozantinib, which is a drug that actually blocks MET and Axel, can we actually make the tumor shrink again? And the answer is yes. Good news is that there are drugs that are in clinical trials that are testing this now. There's one called foretinib, which was tested in papillary kidney cancer, which I mentioned is a disease that seems to have lots of MET, and it looks like there were some really interesting early results. And there's the Meteor study, which has been completed, which in patients with clear cell kidney cancer who had progressed on antiangiogenic therapy got either this drug, this cabozantinib or cometric, or they got Afinitor, Everlimus, and they were looking at whether or not one side did better than the other. Well, we don't know the data result, we don't know the results yet, but there was a uh, press release on Thursday that cabozantinib has just received what's called breakthrough status from the FDA for development in kidney cancer, and this gives them certain privilege. It's kind of like getting, uh, you know, getting premium status on United Airlines uh, in terms of getting your thing processed. It doesn't mean that it's going to get approved, but it means that there's some evidence that this could be a good thing, and we're probably going to find out at ASCO this year. There's several other MET agents, not, that's not the only one, that are being tested now in, uh, in, in kidney cancer, and it'll be interesting to see what, what happens. So Axel is another protein that's upper in kidney cancer, and uh, Dr. Amato Giaccia, uh, a, a collaborator of ours um, who's currently at Stanford University, asked the question of, if you have high levels of Axel, how do patients do? And you can see here what these are, these survival curves. Here's the percentage of people and the y-axis of surviving, and then the, y the, the x-axis is time over months, and if the line goes down faster, that's bad. So you can here see the people who have high axle levels, they are dying considerably faster than people who had low axle levels. So this is obviously a bad thing. He then looked at this in terms of whether or not blocking axle uh, decreased growth of cells, either in, um, in tissue culture or in, in animal tumors, and the answer is yes, it did. And he then, because he has ideas and a company developed a product which is now about to enter into clinical trials which is going to test whether or not axial inhibition is useful in individuals with metastatic kidney cancer. Targeting cancer metabolism. So as I mentioned before, uh, tumors use sugars and various other things differently from normal cells. And this could be a vulnerability. So. Um, I won't torture you with what's called the Krebs cycle or the TCA cycle, but just suffice to say that normally, in a normal happy cell, what we do is we take a sugar up here, we put it through this little grinder, if you will, which produces a whole bunch of um, um, energy, ATPs for us, that makes our cells survive. All right? Tumor cells actually don't do this. They do some things through much more inefficient pathways. They're kind of like SUVs of the cell world in that way. But they then kind of use part of this pathway to, to use some amino acids to do other things that they need. And so this difference, what, what matters is that A, there's a difference, and B, that there's a vulnerability. And so if you come in on this pathway and you block this reverse uh, metabolism that tumor cells use, this can kill cancer cells. Okay, and this is um, something that's been demonstrated. Othan Iliopoulos at, uh, at uh, Harvard has done a lot of this work. Uh, he's, he's demonstrated that this might actually be an Achilles heel for cancer. And there's a drug that is now being tested uh, here at MD Anderson and other places. In terms of the kidney cancer cohort, I think it's actually closed now, but it's being looked at as a way of potentially specifically targeting cancer cells with metabolic inhibitors. So now, last, I think, but not least, the Duke poliovirus study. So this was on 60 Minutes, and um, it was uh, very exciting, I think. But what is this? It is a um, knowledge that the poliovirus receptor, because the, the way a virus gets into a cell is it has to actually have a receptor on the surface of the cell. The receptor for the poliovirus seems to be expressed at much higher levels in cancer cells in a number of different cancer cells, 
compared to uh, normal cells. What this researcher did, and this is actually something that they've been working on now for 20 plus years, was they modified the polio virus to kind of neuter it somewhat, so it didn't actually cause polio, but it still killed the individual cells that it got into, to then say, hey, if we use this, maybe we can use this sort of as a Trojan horse that it'll get into these particular cancer cells, but not into normal cells, and it'll kill those cells. Now, the problem is that the way this is being done now with this Duke study is it's being done in brain cancer patients where they only, they don't have metastatic disease, but what they have is they have a cancer that's in one spot and in a very bad spot, and they directly infuse these viruses into the tumor. This uh, particular receptor is expressed at low-ish levels in other organs of the body, including the normal kidney. So if you were to give this by vein, for example, you probably have a fair bit of toxicity in other organs, which would not be a good thing. So at this point in time, it's very interesting, it's very novel, it's very out of the box. It's certainly not ready for prime time for kidney cancer. So in conclusion, there's no question we've dramatically improved treatment for kidney cancer. Uh, we have anti-angiogenic therapies, which I think have prolonged the lives of a number of individuals. We have um, immune therapies that are dramatically better than the old immunotherapies. But I think all of these are going to have limitations and plateaus. So we have these newer other things that are going to be targeting MET and Axel. There are novel ways of perhaps doing anti-angiogenic therapy even better. And there are ways of, of taking advantage of the new features of tumor metabolism that might give us the next set of therapies that we're going to be talking about in clinical trials in five to 10 years from now. So I'd like to thank uh, everyone for, for, for being here. And again, I want to thank from the bottom of my heart the patients who are here, who are listening, and who help us um, advance cancer. Thank you.